Welcome back to the Data Pro News Podcast. This week's top story from the Data Pro Newsletter. I'm Peter Parker, and this week my colleagues will be discussing the ebook Machine Learning Yearning by Professor Andrew Eng from Stanford University. This episode is brought to you by Coalesce, the only data transformation solution built for scale, a great supporter of the Data Innovators Exchange. Today's discussion goes into depth on the fundamentals of machine learning as discussed in the free downloadable book authored by the leading authority on applied artificial intelligence. This episode was generated using Notebook LM from Google Labs. If you have not experimented with Notebook LM and its extraordinary capabilities to help you rapidly come up to speed on a subject, then check out the links below. Now. Over to my colleagues to discuss machine learning yearning. Okay, so machine learning, right? Everyone's talking about it, all this crazy progress, how it's going to, like, change everything. But uh, what about actually, like, building these systems? Yeah, the nitty-gritty. That's what, that's what machine learning yearning is all about, and that's what we are diving into today. Yeah. We've got excerpts from, you know, Andrew Eng himself. Oh, yeah. And... Trust me, this isn't just for the newbies out there. Even if you've got the ML basics down, right. this this deep dive is packed with the kind of strategic advice that can take your projects from meh to, to mind-blowing. You know what I mean? Totally, yeah, because a lot of people, they kind of get lost in the weeds, mm-hmm. you know, fiddling with algorithms without a real strategy oh, in it's, place. It's like you're trying to build, like, the best cat picture app out there, but you get totally overwhelmed by all the options. Oh, I see. More data, yeah. different types of cat pictures, tweaking that neural network until your eyes bleed. Yeah. Eng's book. For sure. It's like a cheat sheet for making those smart decisions, right, at each crossroads. It's about understanding the clues your data's given you. Yeah. And using that to guide your next move. It's about building that cat picture app, but like fast. Yeah. And then using that that feedback, that real feedback, to, to iterate and improve, you know? And that's what I love about this stuff. It's yeah. hands-on. It is. We're going to get into, like, error analysis, which is, like, detective work for your machine learning model. Oh, wow. You're literally dissecting your algorithm's mistakes to figure out where it's going wrong. Interesting. But before we put on our Sherlock hats, let's talk data. Okay. We all know data is king. Right. But how do we actually make it bow down to our our ML ambitions. I like that. So we've got our training set, of course, where the algorithm, you know, does it's learning magic. But then there's the dev set, the unsung hero of model fine tuning. This is where we experiment yeah. and we see what really sticks. And this is where it gets this is where it gets really strategic. You absolutely don't want to just grab any old data right. for your dev set. It needs to be like a mirror image of the data that your algorithm is gonna encounter, you know, in the real world. Okay. Think about those cat pictures again. Yeah. If you're training on pristine, you know, high res images from the web, Mm. but your users are uploading these blurry masterpieces. Right. Take them with their potato phones. Why? Your your app's going to have a bad case of the catastrophes. Exactly. Your algorithm's going to be totally unprepared for for that wild world of user generated content. And here's the kicker. If your dev set doesn't match that reality. Yeah. You won't even know how badly your model is going to perform until it's too late. Oh, no, it's true. That's that's a recipe for disaster. It is. So, OK, we've got our training and dev sets, you know, prepped. But how do we actually measure our yeah. progress? Right. This is where that trusty evaluation metric comes in. OK. That single number. Yeah. That tells us if we're on the right track. Right. Or heading for a meltdown. Having having that one clear metric <laughs> is is crucial. Think of it as your your algorithm's report card. Trying to juggle multiple metrics at once. It's like comparing apples to oranges gets messy fast. You need that one. You need that one. Crystal clear target to aim for. Exactly. Yeah. So let's say you've got your cat picture app up and running. Your evaluation metric is looking good, but then you notice something strange. What's that? The app keeps mistaking dogs for cats. Oh. Probably not what your cat loving users signed up for. Not ideal. Time to channel our inner detective. Right. And do some some serious error analysis. Yes. So this is where we roll up our sleeves and get up close and personal with our algorithms mistakes. You're literally you're looking for for patterns in those misclassifications. Oh, okay. Are they all, you know, dogs of a certain breed? Is the lighting always terrible? Are those blurry mobile pictures throwing things off? So we gather all these misclassified images 
And then what? Do yeah. we just stare at them until inspiration strikes? It's a bit more systematic than that. Yeah. Okay. A classic approach is to create a spreadsheet where you categorize those errors. Okay. Let's say you find that most mistakes are dogs. A few are lions or tigers, those sneaky great cats. And some are just, you know, plain blurry images. Right. Now you know where to focus your efforts. So in this case, maybe we start by tackling those dog misclassifications. Well, it's tempting, but hold your horses. Okay. We also need to consider the frequency of each error, right? Yeah. Let's say those dog misclassifications are relatively rare. It might be more impactful to focus on those blurry images if they're tripping up the algorithm more often. It's about maximizing our efforts. It's right? like triage for our cat picture app. Find the biggest bleeding wounds first. Exactly. Now, while we're while we're combing through our data for these errors, what happens if we find some of our labels are wrong? Like uh, a picture of a dog is labeled as a cat. Ah, uh, the dreaded mislabeled data. Yeah. It happens more often than you think. Yeah. And it can really mess things up. Yeah. Especially as your algorithm gets more accurate. Interesting. So should we be meticulously fixing every single mislabeled image we find? It depends. Early on, when your classifier is still rough around the edges, say 90% accurate, those mislabeled examples might not be a huge deal. But as you approach higher accuracy, like 98%, mm -hmm. those mislabeled examples can become a bottleneck. Interesting. Yeah. So it's a judgment call. It is. We need to weigh the effort of fixing those labels against the potential improvement in our algorithm's performance. Exactly. Got it. It's all about context. Okay. Now, we've been talking about error analysis with smaller dev sets, but what happens when you've got a mountain of data? Manually examining thousands of errors, it's not exactly a walk in the park. Yeah, my eyes are already starting to glaze over just thinking about it. Right. That's where this eyeball and black box strategy yeah. comes in. Yeah. We split our dev set into two parts. The eyeball set is what we'll manually analyze like we've been discussing. Yeah. We keep this relatively small, 100 to 200 errors, just enough to get a feel for the common mistakes. So we're literally eyeballing those errors, hence the name. Makes sense. What about the black box set? That's the rest of our dev data. We don't manually analyze these examples. Instead, we use them for automated evaluation, tweaking parameters, comparing different algorithms. Mm -hmm. The key is to keep these two sets separate. Ah, I see. So this prevents us from overfitting our fixes to those specific errors we've seen in the eyeball set, right. like having a control group for our error analysis. Technique. Now let's talk about those errors themselves. We know we want to avoid them. Of course. But they're like those pesky flies at a picnic. They just keep coming back. And just like with those flies, it's helpful to know what kind we're dealing with. Okay. In machine learning, there are two main culprits, bias and variance. Okay, let's unpack this bias and variance thing. Think of it like this. You're an archer aiming for a bullseye. Bias is like consistently missing the target in the same way maybe shooting too high or too low every time. Oh. Variance is like having your arrows scattered all over the place, even if some of them are close to the center. So in our cat picture app, high variance would be like acing the training set, but then completely bombing on that dev set. It's like our algorithm has memorized the training data, but it can't generalize to new examples. You gotta be, that's the classic sign of overfitting. Right. On the other hand, high bias, would be like struggling on both the training and dev sets. Oh, okay. It's like our algorithm just can't grasp the essence of what makes a cat a cat. It's underfitting. Oh, yeah. It's just not getting it. So how do we know which error is, is the bigger problem? Do we focus on reducing bias or variance first? That's where this really helpful concept called the optimal error rate comes in. Okay. It's like the theoretical limit of how well any algorithm can perform on this specific task, given the inherent noise, or ambiguity in the data. So it's like a reality check. Like no matter how much we tweak and optimize, we'll never get our error rate below this optimal level. Exactly. Okay. Think about a speech recognition system. If 14% of the audio clips are so noisy that even humans can't understand them, right. then even the best speech recognition system will have at least a 14% error rate. So that 14% is our unavoidable bias. It's baked into the data itself. Right, so if our speech recognition algorithm is already close to that optimal error rate on the training set, we know we shouldn't waste time trying to reduce bias further. We should focus on tackling that variance and improving generalization to the dev set. Okay, so what if our training error is still way higher than that optimal rate? So we know there's room for improvement in terms of bias. Yeah. We can try techniques like increasing the size of our model, adding more features, or modifying our algorithm. It's like choosing the right tool for the job. 
It is. Understanding that optimal error rate helps us decide whether to swing for the fences with bias reduction or focus on the finer points of variance. Exactly. So let's say we've we've sized up our errors mm. and we've determined we've got a high bias problem. Okay. Our algorithm just isn't cutting it. What are some practical ways to give it a boost? One classic technique is to increase the size of your model. In a neural network, this could mean adding more layers or neurons. You're essentially giving your algorithm more horsepower more capacity to learn those complex patterns in the data. But doesn't that risk overfitting? It can. Like we're making it smarter, right. but also potentially more prone to memorizing the training data instead of generalizing. That's the trade-off. Right. But there are techniques like regularization that can help prevent overfitting. Yeah. Even with larger models, think of it like adding guardrails to our training process. Okay. Yeah. So we can push our model to be more complex without necessarily sacrificing generalization. I like it. But what about those situations where variance is the main culprit? Okay. We've got that classic overfitting problem right. where our algorithm is killing it on the training data, but choking on that dev set. Right. How do we fix that? Well, the most straightforward solution is often the most effective. Add more training data. Or data. The more examples your algorithm sees the better it can learn those underlying patterns and avoid getting fixated on the quirks of the training set. More data, the fuel of the machine learning engine. But assuming we don't have an infinite data pipeline, are there any other tricks we can pull out of our sleeves? Absolutely. Okay. You talked about regularization, right. which can help prevent overfitting. Mm -hmm. We can also use early stopping, which is basically hitting the brakes on the training process before it starts overfitting to the training data. I see. It's about finding that sweet spot where the model has learned enough, but it hasn't gone off the rails into memorization territory. It's like a delicate dance between underfitting and overfitting. Exactly. And speaking of visualizing our progress, yes, that's where those handy learning curves come in. Right. They're like a roadmap for our machine learning journey. Yeah, I like that showing us how our algorithm's performance changes as we feed it more data. I see it. Okay, I'm intrigued. Break down these learning curves for me. Imagine a graph where the axis represents our error rate and the x-axis represents the amount of training data. We plot two lines on this graph, one for our training error and one for our dev error. So we can see how well our algorithm is doing on both the data it's learning from, the training set, and the data it's never seen before, the dev set. Precisely. Okay. Now, as we feed our algorithm more and more training data, we'd expect that training error to gradually increase. Okay. It's getting harder for the algorithm to perfectly fit all those examples, mm. which is actually a good thing. Right. We don't want it to just memorize the training data. Exactly. We want it to learn the underlying patterns, the general principles that will allow it to make accurate predictions on new unseen data. Exactly. Oh, right. And that's where that dev error curve comes in. Ideally, we want to see this curve steadily decreasing as we add more data. Okay. This means our algorithm is generalizing well applying what it's learned to those unseen examples. So a downward sloping dev error curve is a good sign? Yes. What about the gap between the training error and dev error? Uh, that gap is telling us a lot about the bias variance trade-off we were discussing earlier. Okay. A large gap suggests high variance. Our algorithm is overfitting. It's performing well on the training data, but struggling to generalize to the dev set. So we'd want to try those variance reduction techniques we talked about, yeah. like adding more data or regularization. Exactly. What about a small gap? A small gap suggests low variance, which is a good thing. Well, it means our algorithm is generalizing well. So the ideal scenario is a steadily decreasing dev error curve with a small gap between the training and dev error, that's our machine learning sweet spot. Exactly. Like it. And those learning curves, they can also warn us when we're hitting a wall. Oh, how so? If that dev error curve starts to flatten out, yeah. even as we add more data, it's a sign that we might be bumping up against that optimal error rate we talked about earlier. So throwing more data at the problem might not be the solution in that case. Exactly. We might need to revisit our features, our model architecture, or even the task itself. It's about knowing when to pivot. Yes. When to shift our strategy based on the feedback we're getting from those learning curves. I like it. Speaking of feedback, yes. let's talk about a common challenge that can really throw a wrench in our machine learning plans. Data mismatch. Ah, uh, yes. This is where our training data doesn't quite reflect the messy realities of the real world. Right. We've touched on this with our, you know, internet cat pictures versus mobile phone 
pictures example. Right. But it goes beyond just the type of data. It does. It's also about the distribution of data. Right. Those subtle differences in how the data is collected or represented, that can really trip up our algorithms. Yeah. So it's not just about having enough data. It's about having the right kind of data. It is. Data that accurately reflects the environment where our algorithm will be put to the test. Precisely. Okay. Let's say we're building a system to predict housing prices. Mm -hmm. We've got this massive data set of housing prices from all over the country. We train our model and it seems to be doing great on our dev set. Yeah. We're feeling confident, maybe even a little cocky. Right. But then we release our amazing housing price predictor into the wild world of, let's say, New York City. Hmm. And disaster. The predictions are all over the place. Our once promising algorithm is suddenly as useful as a magic eight ball. Ouch, that's a tough break. And the reason for this epic failure might be that the distribution of housing prices in New York City is drastically different from the overall distribution in our training data. It could be. Maybe the prices are astronomical. Or maybe the relationship between apartment size and price is totally out of whack due to things like location, amenities, or the whims of the real estate gods. All of those things, yes. So even though our model has learned some general patterns about housing prices, those patterns don't hold up in the unique ecosystem of the New York City market. Yeah, different ball game. It's like trying to apply the rules of jungle warfare to a chess match. Exactly. Right. Totally different game. Different game. Different rules. And that's why understanding those distributional shifts is so important. Right. We need to ask ourselves, is our training data truly representative of the environment where our algorithm will be deployed? And if not? If not, we need to find ways to bridge that gap. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we can collect more data that reflects that target environment. Yeah. Or we can find clever ways to adapt our existing data or algorithms. So there are ways to get around this. There are, yeah. We're not completely dead in the water no. if we encounter this data mismatch problem. Exactly. And speaking of clever ways to bridge gaps, let's talk about a fascinating technique that's been gaining traction in the machine learning world. Transfer learning. Transfer learning is like giving our algorithms like a crash course in a new subject by leveraging what they've already learned in, in a related field. Mm. It's like saying, hey, you've mastered, you know, identifying cats and images. Maybe some of that knowledge will come in handy when we're trying to train you to recognize dogs. So instead of starting from scratch, we're giving our algorithm a head start based yeah. on prior experience. That's that's brilliant. But how does it how does it actually work in practice? How do we transfer that knowledge from one domain to another? One common approach is to take a pre-trained model, a model that's already been trained on a massive data set for a specific task, like image recognition, and then fine tune it on our, our target task, which might have a smaller or more specialized data set. So instead of training a cat detector from scratch, we could take a pre-trained image recognition model that's already learned to recognize thousands of different objects, including cats, and then fine tune it on our data set of cat images. Exactly. Got it. Those early layers of the pre-trained model, they've already learned to detect those you know, basic features like edges, textures, and shapes that are relevant for a wide range of image recognition tasks. So we don't need to waste time and data teaching our algorithm those fundamentals all over again. It's like our algorithm has already gone through boot camp. It knows the basics and now we're giving it specialized training for our specific mission. Exactly, and this can be a huge time saver. Mm -hmm. It can also lead to significant improvements in performance, especially when our target data set is relatively small. It's like giving our algorithm a superpower, the ability to learn from a vast amount of data without actually having to train on all of that data directly. That's amazing. But are there any downsides to transfer learning? Are there any situations where it, it might not be the best approach? Like any tool, transfer learning has its limitations. Well, one potential issue is that the, the pre-trained model mm -hmm. might have learned biases or assumptions from its original training data hmm. that don't quite align with our target task or domain. So if we're not careful, we might be introducing new problems into our model, even yeah. as we're trying to solve others. Yeah, okay. It's like hiring a chef who's brilliant at making Italian food, but then asking them to cook Thai food. Okay. They might be able to whip up something edible. Mm -hmm. But it might not be quite as authentic or delicious as a chef who's been trained specifically in Thai cuisine. That's a great analogy. So it sounds like we need to be mindful of those potential biases mm -hmm. and choose our pre-trained models carefully, making sure they're a good fit for our target task and domain. Exactly. And 
It's also important to remember that transfer learning is not always a magic bullet. Right. Sometimes it's still necessary to train a model from scratch, especially if our target task is very different from anything the pre-trained model has seen before, or if we have a very large and diverse data set. It's like with any tool in our machine learning toolbox, we need to know when to use it and when to choose a different approach. Precisely. Right. Now, speaking of choosing the right approach, right. let's circle back to something we discussed earlier. The importance of comparing our machine learning systems to human level performance. Right, we talked about how that comparison can help us identify flaws in our pipelines. Even when individual components are performing well in isolation, it's like realizing that even though all the players on our team are stars, we're still losing the game because yeah. our overall strategy is flawed. Exactly. Right. And this comparison to human level performance, it's not just about finding flaws. It's also about setting ambitious goals and pushing the boundaries of what's possible with machine learning. So it's not enough to just build a system that can do a task adequately. We want to build systems that can rival or even surpass human capabilities. Exactly. Okay. And to do that, we need to understand the nuances of human expertise, the subtle cues and strategies that humans use to solve complex problems. So it's not just about feeding our algorithms more data. It's about understanding the human element the cognitive processes that we often take for granted. Precisely. Interesting. And this is where fields like cognitive science and human-computer interaction can provide valuable insights okay. by studying how humans learn, perceive, and make decisions. We can gain inspiration for designing more intelligent and effective machine learning systems. It's like we're trying to reverse engineer the human brain to uncover those secrets of intelligence yeah. that we can then translate into algorithms and code. Exactly. And it's a fascinating and challenging endeavor. Yeah. But the potential rewards are enormous. Oh, absolutely. Now, we've talked a lot about the technical aspects of machine learning strategy, but there's another crucial element that we haven't touched on yet the human side of machine learning. Right, because building successful machine learning systems, it's not just about mastering the technical skills, it's also about building the right team, yeah. fostering a culture of collaboration and innovation, and effectively communicating those complex technical concepts to a wider audience. It's like building a bridge yeah. between the world of data and algorithms and the world of human needs and aspirations. Exactly. Right. And that bridge building requires a unique set of skills, yeah. a blend of technical expertise, communication prowess, and empathy. So it's not enough to just be a coding whiz. We also need to be effective storytellers. We do. Able to explain those complex technical concepts in a way that's clear, concise, and engaging for non-technical audience. Exactly, because ultimately, mm -hmm. the success of machine learning depends on its ability to to solve real world problems, to make a positive impact on people's lives. And that requires not just technical brilliance, but also a deep understanding of, of those human needs and aspirations. It's about building systems that are not just intelligent, but also ethical, responsible, and aligned with our values. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a challenge that we must embrace as we continue to push the boundaries of what's possible with machine learning. Well said. And that brings us to another crucial aspect of machine learning strategy. Building systems that are not just effective, but also efficient. Right, because in the real world, resources are often limited. We might have constraints on computing power, data storage, or even time. So it's not enough to just build a system that works. We need to build systems that work smart. Yes. That can achieve our goals while minimizing those costs. And maximizing so, those limited resources. Exactly, and that requires careful planning, optimization, and a deep understanding of those trade-offs between accuracy, efficiency, and complexity. So it's like we're playing a game of chess, trying to anticipate those future moves mm -hmm. to optimize our strategy for both short-term gains and long-term success. It is, yeah, it's a constant balancing act. And it requires us to think strategically about every decision we make, yeah. from the algorithms we choose to the way we design our experiments. It's like we're architects, but instead of bricks and mortar, we're working with data and algorithms to build these complex intelligent systems. All right. And just like an architect needs to consider the load bearing capacity of a beam or the energy efficiency of a building, we need to think about those same principles when we're designing our machine learning systems. Exactly. I, and that brings us to another important aspect of machine learning strategy that's often overlooked. Maintainability. Maintainability. Okay. I'll bite. 
why does maintainability matter in the world of machine learning? Aren't these systems supposed to be self-learning and constantly improving? That's the goal, yeah. But the reality is that machine learning systems, they require ongoing care and feeding, just like any other complex software system. So it's not enough to just build a system that works. We need to build systems that can be easily understood, modified, and updated over time. Precisely. Yeah. So even if we're not planning on, you know, selling our cat picture app to Google, we should still write clean, well-documented code hmm. and maybe break down our system into smaller, more manageable modules, just in case we need to make changes or updates in the future. Exactly. Later it on. might seem like extra work up front, but trust me, it'll save you countless headaches down the road. Yeah, so I can see that. Because here's the thing about machine learning. It's a constantly evolving field. It is. New techniques are emerging all the time. New data sets are becoming available. And the real world itself is constantly changing. So our machine learning systems, they need to be adaptable, flexible, and easy to modify to keep up with those changes. Precisely. And that's why maintainability, it's not just a technical consideration, it's a strategic one. Okay. It's about ensuring that our machine learning systems can continue to deliver value over the long term, that they can adapt to new challenges and opportunities. It's about building systems that are built to last, that can stand the test of time in this ever-changing landscape of data and algorithms. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's what I find so exciting about the field of machine learning. Hmm. It's not just about, you know, writing code or building models. It's about solving real world problems, yeah. pushing the boundaries of what's possible and constantly learning and adapting along the way. It's about embracing that spirit of curiosity, that hmm. desire to understand not just how things work, but also how they can be improved, how they can be made more efficient, more effective and more aligned with our human values. Well said. And on that note, I think we've reached the end of our deep dive into the world of machine learning strategy. We've covered a lot of ground today from the importance of choosing the right data sets and evaluation metrics to the nuances of error analysis, bias variance, trade-offs, and the strategic considerations of transfer learning, human level comparison, and system maintainability. We've seen that building successful machine learning systems, it requires not just you know technical expertise, mm -hmm. but also a strategic mindset a willingness to experiment and learn from our mistakes, and a deep understanding of the problem we're trying to solve and the people we're trying to help. We've also seen that machine learning, it's not just a technical field, yeah. but also a deeply human one, a field that's shaping our world in profound ways. And that requires us to think critically about the ethical implications of our work and the potential impact on society. That's true. So to our listeners, we encourage you to take these insights, these strategies, and apply them to your own machine learning journeys. Yes. Don't be afraid to experiment, to challenge assumptions, mm. and to keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Because the future of machine learning, it's not something that's going to be handed to us. It's something that we're all creating together. Yeah. One line of code, one experiment, one insight at a time. Well said. And on that inspiring note, we'll wrap up this episode of The Deep Dive. Until next time. For more insights and to join the discussion, visit the Data Innovators Exchange, a community dedicated to data professionals. I'm Peter Parker, and that's a wrap for today. Go to datapro.news to get access to weekly news, views, and interviews with the movers and shakers of the data and AI engineering world via email. Sign up today and access even more insights on modern data management practices.